Everybody, welcome to Web3 Sales Gym. Today we have an amazing guest. I'm speaking with Brandon Turp. He's working at QuickNote and also co-founder of BD3. I wanted to chat with Brandon about his amazing community and the benefits that community building can bring to a lot of BDs and other people in the space and essentially motivate you to do the same thing because there is a lot of benefits to, to doing it. Brandon, anything you want to start before we actually dive into the topic? Yeah, no, I mean, happy to answer any questions. Uh, thanks for having me. Perfect. So the community building is, uh, is a very cool thing. There is a lot of different communities right now, professional, uh, community about tokens, uh, just the general community for different people that just want to hang out and talk about crypto. And the majority of them are built on Telegram. So uh, your community, BD3, is also built on Telegram. Uh, I would love to learn um, what changed in your life or in terms of benefits. Like, what are the benefits of doing the community for other people? You being a host, like, what changed in your life in a good way or maybe in a bad way? Uh, essentially, <laughs> we're just interested to, to learn more about that, why people should even embark on that journey. Yeah, sure. Um, why join a community? Well, there's different types of, of communities. Uh, the one that I've kind of organized, BD3, is really a place where people can collaborate and learn and and share together. Uh, the reason I created it was because in the Web3 space, there's a lot of noise and it's helpful to be, you know, in contact with people who are also trying to cut through the noise because sometimes it can be difficult to decipher like what's quality and what's noise. So uh, that was essentially why I created BD3 was to just get a lot of people that are really focused on the business side of blockchain, um, the less speculative side, the more, mm -hmm. you know, builder pushing the actual industry forward side. Um, and the benefits of it are, like I said, I mean, you, you get to connect and learn with other people that are on a similar journey as you. So whether it's a go to market, so BD3 is uh, predominantly go to market professionals in the crypto space. So whether that's sales, product, or marketing, mm -hmm. these are people that are are uh, a little bit more focused on the growth side of the business than the development. I'll say. Um, so whether you're in a community like that and you're at a Web3 business and you're part of this, you know, BD3 community and you're learning from other people at different companies. Oh, what's working? What's not working? Um, or you could be somebody doing in a in a community that's you know totally different like let's say i i love you know i love rock climbing right um yeah. i can be part of this community of expert rock climbers who know all the best places to go all the new tools all the new gadgets so the topic is is really like less important it's more about like who's in the who else is in the community and making sure that all of those people are uh excited to be there and excited to learn and, and kind of grow together so um i would say that's the main benefit it's just like having other people as resources um that you can both learn from and, and that you can help because mm -hmm. communities suck about, if about giving. there's yeah. yeah if there's just people who all they do is take you have to give and take so yeah Okay, it's very cool. It's actually you start the community to get the shortcuts. You because there's a lot of people, and a lot of people can be those shortcuts for you. Now the question is like with every community, the quality of members is always the concern. So, of course, everybody who starts in the community, they would want to build something that is active, where people engage, where people are you know sharing things when they not only take but they also give. How do you go about that? How do you start the community? and make sure that it's active in the beginning it's like and then and it, and it just keeps being active like how how do you how to begin like is the actually the first step is the hardest one yeah i mean definitely your the people that you seed your community with um are going to be really really crucial so finding people that are very interested in kind of your mission and what you're trying to do early on are going to be critical because as you start to onboard more people, the first thing they're going to do when they join is look at what types of conversations are happening. What's the vibe in here? Um, what are people talking about? Is this actually worth, 
you know, my time. And if it's a paid community, is this worth my money? So um, who you start with is, is super, super critical. Um, and naturally with communities though, you know, you're going to have a vast majority of people who are less engaged. Um, not to say that they don't consume, but they might not be the people sparking conversation. Like 80% are going to be what I like to call like lurkers. Like they're just reading. Um, and then maybe 15% of people are going to be somewhat engaged. Um, and then maybe 5% or even less than 5% sometimes are going to be responsible for 90% of the engagement inside the community. So really figuring out like which community members fall into those categories as you do start to grow is super important because you want to enable the people that essentially make the community a fun place to be, especially if the community is predominantly network based as opposed to like a course community. Cause I want to make that, you know, distinguishment because yeah. there are, there are, you know, creators and people like that who create a, a course and then there are people together, but um, especially for, for a professional network, mm -hmm. you're going to want to, like I said, uh, identify who those different categories of community members are. Cool. So if I would distill that to the golden nugget is, in the beginning, you want to form a group of people that are going to be active because essentially that 5-10% of people, they going to be creating the majority of activity in the community. And that's and that's okay. Like I, I think a lot of people think that once they, let's say they add 100 people to the community and they expect all 100 of them actively engage. But it's actually not, doesn't work like that. It's like in the park. You go in the park and then you see somebody's like resting and there's some somebody's having a picnic somebody's like uh, or jogging or etc 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 so it's everybody's doing different things the same gonna be in the community if everybody just right. starts messaging and doing the thing and posting content that's going to destroy the community the same way as it would destroy if everybody just willing to get 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 now here's another question for you so like let's say the person that's listening to this podcast they uh, they did they started the community they like everything and then basically they start uh, attracting new members. They want to attract new members. They want to grow the community, and but they do not want to lose this vibe of a small community, let's say, because it's like an ecosystem. Let's say you create an ecosystem. How do you add new members to it? How do you onboard? How do you increase the complexity of the community without losing this main element of engaging people? Hmm. Well, I mean, first and foremost, you need to understand, like, why people are there and ultimately that boils down to like what your offer is and you need to make sure that you're able to deliver on your offer so if somebody visited your landing page or they saw your x post or your linkedin post and they join your community they joined based on something that they saw and something that they saw is going to be highly correlated to what they're expecting to get out of being a member of the community so your job as the community owner or manager is to make sure that those people are essentially getting what they came for. Um, and that can be learning a new skill or, you know, learning how to make more money or, mm -hmm. you know, getting healthier, you know, it could be, and, and way more things than that too, but it's your job to understand what they want and make sure that you can deliver upon that because if you don't, people are people are just gonna leave, um, and you have to treat it. It's like a product. I mean, it's it's yeah. honestly not that different from software. Um, the idea is that your community should be so good that the people inside it are having such a positive experience that they're actually promoting it for you. No different from when I buy an iPhone and. I'm so happy about it that I can't, that I'm talking about it with my friends. Your yeah. community is no different. So, but in order for them to get excited and want to talk about it, you have to make sure that they're getting what they came for. Okay. That's a good insight. If you, if you build a cool, cool community, then your members would be the first one to talk about you and chill about you because it's, it's essential thing. If I, if I have something that's very cool, I'm going to tell my friends. If I went for a good movie, I'm going to do the same. And yeah, which brings down to one more point is like I heard the saying that your 
the quality of the community is defined by its weakest member. So do you agree or you disagree with this thing or and why? Yeah. I I would say I, I both agree and, and disagree. I think there, there needs to be definitely like a bar uh, that needs to be met and every person who joins um, should be up to to meet that bar and if, if they don't then you should probably remove them uh, like you don't want people spamming you don't want people over shilling so mm -hmm. you need to set rules around that type of stuff um, but there and the reason i say partially disagree is because again depending on your community like people with having having people with different skill sets is actually incredibly beneficial and it's something that i learned with bd3 too because when bd3 started it's literally in the name right bd3 it was mostly people in like business development roles um and that over time kind of evolved to people in product people in marketing there's even some people that are in engineering but they're more fit more they're just curious or interested in learning about the actual growth and business side of startups. And what we found was at the beginning, when I wouldn't let anyone else but be people, there was definitely good conversation. Don't get me wrong, but I found that the quality of the conversation actually became enhanced when we started to add people with different skill sets to the community. So, um, you know, if I'm a BD person and, you know, I'm, I'm really strong with, you know, channel partnerships and, uh, you know, account mapping and getting leads and strategic deals, but I know nothing about per performance marketing. There's people in the community that are experts in performance marketing, but they don't understand anything about maybe what, you know, um, and it's very, it can be very complimentary. So it's kind of why I say like, it depends how you define, uh, you know, the point of view, point of view defines it. Yeah, sure. Exactly. So, mm -hmm. um, just from a quality, I would say yes, in terms of like the quality and integrity and like how a person kind of carries themselves just on a personal level. Yes, mm -hmm. definitely. But when it comes to skill set. Uh, I think the more skill sets, uh, the better. Cool. That's, uh, that's a very good advice. The last question to you would be is uh, monetization. So besides the intangible benefits that you get having the network and uh, just overall moving faster in the industry, uh, how do you go? Because your community is paid. Was it always paid? Did you start it as paid? Have you seen any examples of the community that started as free and that in transition to be paid? Um, and uh, what's involved in that transition or what's involved in it, in it being paid? Because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's like another threshold, which is very good uh, because it helps you to sort out and filter out people that are not committed to be in this environment. Um, what's yeah. your take on becoming paid? Yeah, this is a kind of a hard one. I mean, I'll say when I started BD3, I actually didn't have any intention of it becoming a paid community. Um, it was just something that I started for value for me so I could learn from other people. Um, but it ended up becoming essentially so valuable for other people as well that it continued to grow. And as it continued to grow, it became more work for me, but like it was work that I enjoyed doing um, just admin um, getting people onboarded, getting people enabled, hosting calls, um, you know, any type of partnerships or education that's offered within the community. I mean, it now was demanding my time. So because of that, I was like, all right, either this community is just going to not have any quality and there's, it's not going to be exciting to be here, or I can start to justify my time and make it paid and also get more signal because if someone takes out their credit card uh, and puts it down, typically there's pretty high signal that they're actually interested in being a part of that thing. Um, so for me, after 
I'd say almost a year, I actually made it paid just because I thought that was what was in the best interest of the community. But there's, if your goal is to make money, I mean, there's a, a couple different ways you could go about it. Mine was essentially free for a long time. Then I made it paid. Um, the, big, the early people, they got an offer to, to pay a one-time lifetime fee. Um, or you can have multiple communities. I've seen this where you have a free one and it's somewhat valuable, but then you have another community that's really jam-packed with value. And the idea is with the free one, you get people just enough to where they can see how valuable it might be to be part of the paid one. And then you kind of convert people. That's a strategy that I've seen. And then I've also seen one where it's free. Let's say you cap your community at a hundred people. It's free, but for everyone else, um, and there are ways to measure engaged engagement and engaged users for every person you add after that, um, you're going to start charging. So let's say the 101st person is going to be paid, but you're going to remove the least engaged person. So it's always going to be a hundred people. Um, so that's an interesting, that's like kind of a yeah, newer that's interesting. Growth, yeah. that's a newer kind of growth hack that I've seen people do because then it kind of forces people to be engaged if they want to stay there. Um, and then once everyone's paid, let's say you've weeded, you've got all the, I don't know, let's say you've got all the people out that, that weren't, that, that were free. Mm -hmm. you can also start to increase the price as well because ultimately the community is at the end of the day like the com the community is kind of the product and if the product is if the community is really quality that means the product is really quality which means you can kind of demand more sure. so the more value the more the more you can charge too so that can either be in quality of members or quantity or a combination of both um but those are a few different. There's also a lot of benefits to having free communities for your brand, um, especially if your goal is to drive uh, product development, because mm -hmm. there you can essentially think of a community as like a super user of whatever it is that you, you know, whatever, whether it's software or service or, or mm -hmm. anything else like these you, you, communities, I think are I think every B2B business is going to have like an actual organized community. Some people used to call them super users, but now I think it's gonna be called a community. And th these are really high signal people to get feedback from. So there's also a lot of value because you can, which I haven't even touched on, but you can actually launch products um, out of communities as well. Very cool. I feel that this interview was full and packed with insights. We, we got the real master, <laughs> we got the real master here. So Brandon, I really enjoyed our conversation and uh, that was an amazing conversation. And I'm going to leave all the li links for you to join the BD3, to read more about you on LinkedIn for folks down there. And I hope that people listening to this got inspired to start your own community and prioritizing the quality because that's, that's the product. The more quality product you do, the more you can charge uh, for the product, the more value it has. Absolutely, man. Thanks for having me. Um, always down to chat, all things internet, Web3, community. So uh, feel free to reach out to me anytime if you're watching this video. Let's go. Perfect. See you guys. <laughs>